everybody. Welcome to the Base Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. So, today on the show, I'm talking to acoustic and electric bassist Gary Wicks. Gary has performed with a whole host of folks, including Quincy Jones, uh, Manhattan Transfer, John Hendricks, uh, Monica Mancini, and a lot of other people. Uh, we were talking before the recording started, and the conversation here kind of picks up where we were at. I feel like we uh, covered some really cool ground. He talks about some techniques he uses to stay centered before he plays, what it was like getting lessons from Milt Hinton, uh, his time at the New England Conservatory, and some ideals he communicates to his students that all come from a real-world perspective. Uh, I had a lot of fun connecting with Gary again, and uh, here's my friend Gary Wicks. Yeah, it's weird in my head, but I'm not. Gonna Lots of things are weird in my head. <laughs> <laughs> this this is the least of them. <laughs> Gary, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, man. How uh, are you? Right before we turn on the mics, we're talking about teaching styles. Mm. Let's pick up that conversation. Yes. Where were we? Uh, where were we at? We were talking about preparing uh, students with real life training, so not yeah. just a curriculum. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I I always try to um, find sort of an anecdotal approach when I'm showing a student something where it's not just here's where you put your finger, here's how you play this line, but I mean, that's part of it, getting them prepared on the music. But then outside of that, if it's for an audition or if it's uh, for a performance, even if it's a school thing or uh, uh, real life thing like things that they're not experienced with yet to kind of talk about that to say like for example if it's an audition let's say you want to be at like to really feel comfortable in the performance you think you need to be at like 90 percent solid on the music you feel like that's good enough right but when you step into an audition if you haven't done it before or very little experience you're not necessarily prepared for the other elements that affect you uh-huh. all of a sudden you start to feel nervous and you don't know why right. like why is there a panel of people sitting there with pencils yeah. all writing something down at the same time what did i just do wrong right. you know or uh y- other life forces affect you like you get a flat tire on your way and you change the tire and now instead of being early you're getting there just in time to walk in and start yeah. playing you're a little you frazzled know, frazzled yeah. y- you know how to center yourself all these things that can affect your performance that we're now if everything had gone perfectly, you would have been in an okay place for your performance. Yeah. But now you're under the gun. You're, you're, you're not feeling at 90%. You're feeling at like 70%. Sure. And that's not going to cut it, right? There's going to be somebody else who's going to come in who's going to be at 90% and they're going to get the job. Right. The, and maybe with uh, more comfortability. Exactly. In addition to the 90%. So how do you, how do you go about teaching students about nerves? So w- one of the things is I try to impress upon them, and I f- I've found... The success I've had with this point is when they've actually been through it and seen what I meant is to be so far prepared that it feels like you could be chucking tomatoes at them and that's not going to mess them up. Right. Right. Like just know the music cold and have it so well prepared that you don't need to look at the music. You know, I could be, you know, dancing in front of you, making faces and it's not going to break your concentration. Right. Right. Whereas if you don't have the music that well learned and you still need to look at it and you're still a little shaky at a couple parts, but you're hoping you can pull it off then you're going to easily get thrown off if something goes slightly wrong. So the first thing I try to impress upon them is to be as absolutely prepared as possible. Yeah. Um, You know, like, let's say the piece of music should be at, like, 120 BPM. I say, okay, make sure you can play it at, like, 150. Yeah. Make sure you can play it at 100. Right. Be able to play it really flawlessly at different tempos. That way, you're okay if you come in and they say, you know, we'd actually like to hear it a little faster. Or actually, we'd like to hear it a little slower here. What that feels like, then you're not like, oh my god, right. I don't know what to do. And it's really internalized. Yeah, so that you really are just comfortable musically, so that you can be prepared to manage the other things that come at you. Another thing I talk about with students in regards to these high pr- high pressure situations um, isn't necessarily musical ideas, but how to center yourself, yeah. how to get yourself. Yeah, to going going back, back to the down. flat tire. Yeah, uh, you know analogy you, you just use like that can happen in life mm-hmm. you know and, and it has i was on my way to a gig one time i was coming from a church gig in like the south bay area trying to get up to koreatown for an afternoon jazz hit yeah and i was looking at the clock i'm like oh man i'm gonna be early i'll have time to grab lunch my tire blows out oh and i'm stuck on the side of the road waiting because i 
turns out I don't have anything in my car to change the tire. I have the spare, but I don't have a jack or, or anything. And I realize... Do you have AAA? Um, well, I roadside assistance with my insurance. Okay. So I call, but it's a Sunday. And Burn. And I'm not, and I'm, I'm told that I'll get a call from the tow guy when they're on their way. Yeah. Uh, about 45 minutes in, CHP pulls up behind me and is like, you know, is everything okay? Why are you sitting on the side of the road? I'm like, tire blow out. <laughs> and their guy comes and fixes it for me. Okay. Before I ever even get a call from the insurance roadside assistance. Yeah. I make it to the gig about 10 minutes past the downbeat. Okay. But now, of course, I've got that frazzled energy right. of like rushing in, yeah. trying to set up quickly. And they're like, it's okay, man. We understand. Take your time. Yeah, but yeah. I don't feel like I can take No, right. Time. You got it. You got all the anxiety. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it happens. It can happen. Yeah. Um, I've also told my students, like, listen, any situation that you think could happen, I've probably been there. Yeah. I've broken a low E string out of my upright bass when I was on tour with a <laughs> saxophone quartet. It was four saxes, acoustic bass, and drums. So there's no piano. There's no guitar. Yeah. No, so I'm the harmonic yeah, instrument, right. if you will, and my low E string breaks. Like, who breaks low E strings yeah. on an upright bass? Right. Oh, well, the guy who's trying to see how long his strings can last because they're <laughs> expensive, right? That guy. How long do they, they last? I'm uh, notorious for that, too. Uh, man, those strings were old. I love dead the, strings, the, so I kind of push them. Yeah, I don't remember. This was, man, this is a long time ago now, but this was, they were very old. And yeah. so the band leader says, okay, we're going to take an early break where our bass player changes his string. And, <laughs> and then I had to inform him that I don't have any spare strings yeah, with me because right. who has spare upright bass no, strings? Right. Well, you know, now I do. Yeah. I have right. spare strings and with every bass. Jack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, exactly. It's like you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. I've, I was on stage with the Blue Note when I was working with Manhattan Transfer and they were, the singers were headed to the stage when all of a sudden I hear a crackling come out of my amp. And I'm thinking, oh, that's weird. And I uh, jiggle the cable plugged into my pickup, and I hear this kind of crackle get louder, and then almost like a pop and a hiss. Yeah. Realize the pickup just died. And so I waved to the MD. That was on your upright? Yeah. Okay. So then I'm like, wait, did that just happen? So I quickly hit the AB switch to switch to my electric base to see if it was the amp. Right. But that signal's coming through fine. I'm like, okay, okay back to the upright. Nope, dead. So I waved to the MD like, uh, wait, wait, hey, hang on, hang on. And I wave <laughs> over the sound guy. So they call off the singers. They're, they kind of stop midway to the stage. And the sound guy comes like, what happened? Uh, the pickup broke. He's like, well, where's your backup? I said, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go buy one tomorrow morning. Right. You know, we're in New York City. I'm going to go down to Gage of course. Base Shop yeah. tomorrow morning. But right now, yeah. I kind of got Can't a situation. Uh, He's like, okay, here. Grabs a microphone and wraps it in a towel, shoves it in the bridge of the bass, yeah. kicks a wedge towards me and says, go, I'll dial you in. Yeah. Singers run on stage. I actually really like that sound. And like that, we, yeah. that sound works great on my bass in the studio. Yeah. Not great for a live situation on, no, uh, on stage with a full band. No. But got through it. Yeah. But once again, I was like, okay. Note to self, yeah. always have a backup pickup. Now so you're I just bringing a whole spare bass all the time now? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So now I travel with extra strings, extra pickups, sure. like always. I mean, yeah. And right, so, so I was just telling like my a students. Sunday afternoon brunch gig is like four bases, <laughs> two amps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Roadside assistance. Exactly. On exactly. I'm full tank of gas. And I'm carried in on a stretcher <laughs> just, to, just in case I should hurt myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I tell my students, like back to the original question, how to prepare for life stuff. I just say, listen, and I give them some of these examples. Sure. Anything can go wrong. Things that you don't even think you need to prepare for can happen. So you need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Sure. As often as possible, not to be sort of a naysayer, but, you know, within reason. Yeah, like, don't live in that space, but be yeah. aware that that exactly. might happen. Exactly, so yeah. that when it does happen, you're you're not like, oh, man, I don't know what to do, sorry. Instead, you're like, give me 10 minutes, I can fix this. And people are like, man, yeah. good on you, you're a pro, you're prepared, right. right? A lot of those things I've learned from doing. But so I tell my students, be prepared for something to go terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, everything's going to go really well, and you're sure. going to be in great shape. You know, when something does go wrong, something happens, uh, you didn't leave enough time on the road, LA traffic, you, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you're running behind. When it does go wrong and you're feeling that anxiety, your, your, your adrenaline is oh, pumping, that's the worst. it's the worst way to play. You need to yeah. center yourself. So you need to try to find for you what works as a technique to calm yourself back down. Yeah. You know, I, one thing that always works for me, and it sounds really silly, is I just kind of slow my breathing down, kind of sure. close my eyes for a minute, just try to find a way to like physically center yeah. myself and calm myself Decompress from all that. Yeah. Yeah. Because y you have to. Yeah. You're going to like pop a blood vessel, right? Yeah. You gotta I try to get to the gig like 
early because they'll just right. set up, get in the space, right? Either eat at the restaurant or wherever the gig is, you know. And I, I used to be that guy. Now with like two kids and running around, often I'm like just getting there in time, and I hate that feeling. Oh. But so I try to, at the very least, be as prepared as I can yeah. in those situations. Or if I know that it's a tight connection, I'll tell the band leader like, "Hey, just a heads up, I might be getting there like." Coming really, in hot. Re- really yeah. young, I might yeah. be coming in hot, but I will be there and I won't miss the downbeat. Sure. You know, like I, I, I make sure that if, if I accept a gig, that I'm not going to be like, oh, I can't make the downbeat, but I'll, right. I'll be there because yeah, yeah. that's not being there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so as far as like the teaching thing, I try to like give them examples and say like, hey, learn from my mistakes or my experiences. Um, plan ahead, be as prepared as you can, and know for yourself anything that you know works for you to kind of center yourself in a stressful situation even if nothing's going wrong at that moment when you're about to perform for people you'll find all of a sudden your your heart's pounding yeah um and things feel tense and i and musically i always talk to them about whatever the pieces they're going to play know what's the hardest part in that piece for you Mm -hmm. if it's a classical piece if it's a jazz piece whatever it is what's the hardest thing is it a fast run is it you know whatever it might be and when you're before you start to play and you're centering yourself to begin Think about that part and think about the tempo you need to play that part where you can nail it. Yeah. And then start. Gauge Don't, it from there. Yeah. Usually the first few notes you're going to play are going to be pretty easy and you could start too fast because your adrenaline's pumping. And right. then you get to that hard part and you're like, oh, yeah. And if they practice it from beginning to end in that way instead of like jumping in at the most difficult passage. You know, like if they practice it from beginning to end, they've played the beginning notes more than they've played any of it. Sure. So that's a obviously they're going to have that together. Yeah. You know, it's exactly. going to it's going to be that rough section in the middle that's always giving them a little bit of truff, uh, trouble that yeah. they're, you know, they're kind of keeping an eye and an ear on. Exactly. You know, instead of starting there. Mm-hmm. Like that's the roughest part of it, start there. Yeah. You know, cuz spend the most time on that cuz that's Yeah. Exactly. You don't want to get all the way there and then you just fold. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That would the, suck. Yeah, the folding doesn't help anybody. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it, it in any like, scenario. I've also had bad auditions where I can say like, yeah, I'm, I'm not just telling you this because I read it in a, in a book. Right. Or a teacher told me. Like, Were those school or professional? Um, Both. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember when I was in school, um, my junior year, I was definitely starting to have a little more fun and not spend as much time in the practice room as I had been the first two years. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was coming up on time for my jury. I sort of knew myself in how much time I needed. Like my plan was to sort of kind of buckle down a few weeks out and really like put in the hours and be ready instead of like a little bit here and there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I still suck at that way of thinking, like yeah, the daily exactly. investment of like it's hard. instead of just like the cram of like right. I'm just gonna pull 32 hour days <laughs> to try to get this all done. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know. I had the misfortune of coming down with the flu, probably the worst uh-huh. flu I think I've ever had in my life, where I was like in bed for close to two weeks, just sick as a dog. Oh, man. Like dropped weight. I was just weak. Junior in and high school? No, it was uh, college. Junior was, college, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I should have gone to my teacher and said, I- I've been really sick. I am in no shape to do my jury. But I guess I felt the responsibility to try and pull it out. So yeah. I'm like, I-, I can do it. I can do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, I was just I was I was not ready yeah. and I kind of fumbled my way through the piece but it wasn't just that I also I was weak physically still sure. and I had this kind of anemic sound it was a classical thing okay. and you know it just sounded like your mind's it, not sharp yeah and, no. and and but also my my sound my vibrato everything was just very kind of anemic and tired sounding yeah. and I was sweating bullets I was still sick just trying to get oh. through it and to the point where they were like um why why is he here yeah, <laughs> right. And and my teacher, you know, went to bat for me. He was like, "I know he's been really sick the last couple of weeks. He's he's not feeling well. He usually plays better than this." Yeah. Uh, you know, cuz they were ready to just fail me. Oh, wow. Cuz I just bombed it. Okay. I was just I sh- I was in an embarrassment. What was the audition for? It was the jury. Okay. Like, so okay. it was like the jury. So this was at New England Conservatory, and the way their juries work is it's just one at the end of the school year. Okay. And it basically determines do you get to stay, first of all? Oh. And do you get to move on to the next you year? You got to earn your keep. You got to earn your yeah. keep. And they could say, well, we'll let you stay, but we're not going to promote you to the next year. You're going to have to repeat your junior year. Okay. Or in my case, what they did, because my teacher stuck up for me because he knew my playing better than this string faculty that didn't know my name from yeah. anyone else's, uh, said, 
you know, give him the summer. He'll do it again in the fall. And if he doesn't, I, I vouch for him. I put my name on the line. Oh, wow. If he doesn't, yeah. if he doesn't impress you, then okay. do, do what you got to do. That's really, who was the teacher? Uh, his name is Don Palma. Okay. Um, so he's the head of the bass department at New England Conservatory, and he's the bassist with the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. He was in the L.A. Phil at one point. Okay. Um, just phenomenal player. Really yeah. cool guy. Um, and so he came up to me after his, in, and he was like, so... <laughs> That happened. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, that was not my finest hour. He's like, no, not even close. He's yeah. like, he explained to me what was happening. So, I sp- you know, of course, I got a formal letter home, which my parents really appreciated that I was on, uh, how do they word it? I think I was on probation or something. Okay. Uh, so I busted my hump that summer. Yeah. I practiced like every day, hours every day. Came back in the fall. And now I'm going into my senior year, so I'm also preparing recital material. Right. But I have to do redo my jury, so I'm trying to stay sharp on that and prepare other music. Okay. So when I finally did the, the redid the jury, the head of the string department was there, and he was like, "Oh, he sounds wonderful. Why are we listening to him again? I don't remember. What was this about?" Oh, uh, they they had yeah. spaced. It. Yeah. Well, I mean, they knew there was a problem, but he was like listening to my playing. Then he was like, "Oh, he sounds fantastic. I I don't recall what was the problem." <laughs> you know? And uh, that affected uh, classical pseudo uh european accent yeah. but he's probably from like the bronx I don't know. <laughs> but uh um yeah it's my teacher was like yeah well there you go and everything right. was fine but it was one of those times when i i didn't prepare as well as i should have ahead of time but even still life happened and i should have been smart enough to say like yeah i'm i'm in i'm i'm in no shape for this can we work something out yeah um, yeah i mean i, I guess that's a tricky circumstance specifically because, like, would you he would you have known to ask? Like, no, you, you know what I mean. Like, this you don't know is, the yeah how much they can nudge things. Yeah, and like I a, think as in like that a, scenario, it's best that you did it. Yeah, as like a twenty year old kid who doesn't know anything, you're just right. like, well, I was told I have to be here to take right. the test, so I'm here, or yeah. I'm not there and I get failed. Exactly. Yeah. It never dawned on me that maybe I could have asked for like a stay of execution. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and uh. And I don't know, actually, I don't know if they would have even granted that, you know? Because it wasn't your wasn't teacher. Your teacher was the yeah. one that uh, exactly. He's the one stepped that said, in. Yeah. Right. If I had come to them and said, I'm really sick, I can't play today, I don't know what they would have said. Sure. I, I You know, I've never been in that situation, and I don't know of anyone else that has. So, yeah, yeah those things happen. You know? Now, you have uh, two children, and the correlation I'm curious about is teaching these young students uh, how to prepare for things that you had to learn the hard way. Mm. That seems like something my dad would have told me growing up. Sure. And I would have just been like, eh. <laughs> and like in life, still learned it the hard way. Right, right, right. Do you think you would have learned it the same as a bass player if they would have told you that? Mm. Like, because I think. Uh, I, I think some things, yes. I think some things I would have been like, really, I'm going to break the E string on an upright <laughs> bass. Yeah, that that, those, seems, those things are like cable. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Exactly. Right. I think certain things would have just happened. But. Um, my dad was a bass player and he was, okay. he was really good at, um, uh, upright or electric. Yes. And yes. Okay. He was really good at, um, he was a good teacher and he was really good at that sort of preparedness way of sure. like, so a lot of things I feel like I do know or what have been prepared for because he would say, well, you gotta be ready for anything. Right. Um, he always called himself a jack of all trades bassist. He'd be playing in the symphony on a Friday night and a, a wedding band Saturday afternoon. Yeah, and just a jazz gig Saturday in night. The, in the trenches. In the trenches doing Love it all. It. And and that mindset of like you just gotta be prepared for whatever. Yeah. Um and just manage it. And so often there was that mentality behind things he would teach me or talk to me about. Um Was that was that here in LA? No, I grew up in Albany, New York. Okay. Um and so yeah, so like what you're saying, like, w- would I have been as well prepared with some of these situations if somebody had said, you know, this could happen? Right. Um, I think some things, yes, and some things, y- you're just, no matter how, what somebody tells you, you have y- to kind of... You have to go through it. You yeah. have to go through it. And I, and that's sort of the approach I've taken with some students is I've said, like, listen, I'm going to tell you this thing that happened to me yeah. and let it benefit you. But there's a chance that you probably will only really understand this when it happens to you. <laughs> right, you know, right. that's actually my dad's line is yeah. like, the older you get, the smarter I'll become, <laughs> uh, you know, like, <laughs> and apparently his dad told him that. And that's just like the Roberts tradition. Now. There you go. Um, but yeah, like yeah. it'll make sense when you're older. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And 
Yeah, that's the thing too. Like when you're younger, you don't you don't worry about stuff like that. Nope. You're like you're like I just want to play. Right. You're, you're, all you want to do is be your be your hero. Yeah. That's exactly. It. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So some some things yeah, some things no. I just had to learn the hard way. Sure. Um, yeah. So undergrad was in classical, grad in jazz. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I uh, I went to New England Conservatory in Boston. Um, it was kind of funny. I auditioned as a classical performance major. I had it in my head. I wanted to be a symphony guy. Okay. Um, the summer before my senior year in high school, I went out to Tanglewood and was part of the high school Tanglewood Music Festival program where you get lessons and master classes with members of the Boston Symphony because that's their summer home. Okay. And the Boston Symphony has one of the best bass sections in the world. Like, that's a monster bass section. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I want to study with these guys. Yeah. And, like, where do they teach? Boston. I want to go to school in Boston. What schools are there? Sure. And I started looking at schools that offered both um, jazz and classical. And New England Conservatory was... Just to the diversify your... Yeah, because I was already playing a lot of styles. I played electric bass. I played upright okay. bass. And I actually turned down an offer from Cleveland Institute because it was strictly classical. And I didn't want to be somewhere where it was only one thing. Um, I, always, I often think back about that. Like, I wonder what trajectory I would have gone onto with my music my life had I done that sure um because I don't think I would have shut out these other interests but I would have been much more focused only on classical for a few years yeah where at, at NEC I was focused on the classical that was my major but uh at the same time I started a band with friends I met at school and we had an R&B funk band that was gigging yeah. around town Sweet. um I was playing Top in jazz or original it was no it was uh well eventually we started to work some originals in but ori it started out being like playing uh James Brown grooves and right. Stevie Wonder tunes Aretha you know yeah. Marvin Gaye all that stuff Perfect. um you know and uh uh but so I was doing a lot of different things but so I came in I got accepted and I came in as a classical major and then I had this moment of 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 doubt where I was like but it's going to be really hard to survive in this world as a as a musician maybe I should get a teaching degree yeah and they have an ed department so went back out to the school and met with the head of the music ed program and, and said I, I think I want to switch into the music ed program and they're like well you've been accepted as a performance major so you definitely qualify if you want to make that change that's fine we'll do it so I make the change so okay. I get there in the fall now that I'm a music ed major they're not as concerned about what I do with my private lessons and some of my um, electives with my classes because if I was like strictly classical performance as I auditioned, yeah. they would be can be very, very strict as far as what they'll let you do because sure. they want to make sure you're on the right track. Yeah. Right? So because of that, I was able to set up, split my private lessons, half with a classical teacher from the Boston Symphony and half with a jazz teacher. Oh, dope. Um, and then I was taking some jazz classes. I was in a jazz combo as well as being in the symphony. So I was getting the best of both worlds now. Right. But the music ed program, turns out, was being phased out. And it was, they they were phasing out that side of the school and it was going to be really a performance so only school. So did you not have to do a lot of those methods class for all the instruments and stuff that just well, seems like a total time suck? Well, I was supposed to, but... Oh, within a week of, of I was like, no, this is not right. I don't want <laughs> to do this. So I went back to the registrar and I was you like, don't learn, yeah, you know, I was suit. like, I was like, I just want to play bass. Yeah. Um, I was like, can we switch my major back to classical performance? And, and they're like, well, since you were accepted as that, we, yeah, we can do that. So they switched it back. But I'd already gotten all my classes signed off on and everything. So I had my studio lesson time split as in classical. Okay. So that first semester went on like that. Yeah. So in the start of the second semester, um, when I was signing up for classes, the the registrar saying, "But well, now you're a classical major, but you got jazz lessons." I said, "Oh yeah, well the the, um, the student advisor said I could do that, which they did yeah. when I was a music ed major." Right. And like, oh, okay, then they approve it. Okay. And I, I was getting away with it. So this is the other part about the jury that I bombed my junior year. Okay. For my f freshman, sophomore, and junior year, I was able to pull this off because I kept saying, oh, I was approved by the advisor. Oh, okay, sure. we'll let you do it. But finally, when I had that terrible jury, well, I had a good jury my freshman year, a good jury my sophomore year, nobody batted an eye. They're like, okay, right, pass, just under move the radar. on, just keep doing your thing. Uh -huh. Everybody's happy. Third year, I bought my jury, and they're like, yeah, what's going on with him? Look at his credits. His credits are all over the place. How is he going to graduate on time with a classical degree when he's got, you know, a jazz arranging class? He's got <laughs> big band. He's got combo. He's got, right. like, what? what is this? He's got jazz rhythmic skills class. What is this? <laughs> and they're like, that, and that's when my teacher was like, okay. So the other part of what my private teacher did for me, he said, listen, I've worked this out for you, but here's the other thing. Next year, your senior year, you've got to go full classical. 
Mm. You've got to do your studio lesson times 100% with me. Okay. No jazz lessons. You've got to fill all your electives with some of the classical harmony and right. theory you classes that you've got. You've got to knock it out or else you won't graduate on time. Right. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Point taken. So I came in as a classical major. I had this moment of doubt. I wanted to be a music ed major to have the teaching degree so I could get a teaching job. Sure. And then I was like, for the cost of this school, this private conservatory, like, no. I should be getting the performance degree. That's This is a performance, elite performance school. I should focus on that. Yeah. And when I'm done, if I really feel like I need the teaching degree, I could go back home to, to Albany, go to the state school for like a fraction of the price and right. get a teaching degree. That will be just as valid as a teaching d- certificate, right? And that that became my new plan. Okay. And so I, so I got away with being like kind of – doing a double major essentially yeah almost until they caught me yeah and they were like what what have you been doing <laughs> did your dad have a degree uh yeah he so he went to um a state uh, new york state school in potsdam new york where they have a good music school called the crane school of music okay um so that was already on your radar to go to school for music and like go through and get a degree and uh, that's part of it all. Yeah, yeah. I was like, luckily, because I had a musician father who was a professional musician, he was like, sure, go to music school. Right. He wasn't yeah. like, you're going to waste your life. Go, right, like go get a go real... Go to school yeah. for something else and then do that on the side. Yeah, yeah. he was like, yeah, if you're going to do it, do it right. Sure. You know? Um, so that was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's how that happened. <laughs> who, were, who were you being exposed to jazz-wise? Like, who was your teacher... You had already had some um, foundation laid in your playing uh, and understanding the the jazz guys. Growing up, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, partly because of my dad, because my dad was a great jazz player, and he would, he was playing with all the greats in the in the on the scene. So okay. there'd be times there'd be jam sessions in our basement, and I would just be hanging out with, with like these great players. Just I didn't know what they were playing, but it sounded cool. Sure. And uh, and you know, listening to music in the car, you know, I I learned early on that Ray Brown is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh players like that we'd we'd listen to together all the time. So my dad would expose me to a lot of great music like that. Um but you get to college and it's you already had kind of have your feet underneath you, I guess is where I was going. And so sure. how did your jazz teacher navigate that where you yeah. already had some knowledge. Yeah. You had yeah. maybe an opinion, an approach, something you already yeah. gravitated to. Yeah. Well I think part of what happened then was um it was a combination of the faculty and then the the new peers, the new friends I was making, mm-hmm. who were all bringing their own interests. Sure. And, and I was telling uh, some students this recently, like now we're in the age of the internet and yeah. YouTube, where you can find anything at your beck and call. It's yeah. almost too much, but there's so much. I agree. I've talked about yeah. that on here before, about yeah. finding new music, because it's so... Exactly. They're so saturated. Yeah, yeah, yeah so Like, much. I get lost in it, and it's just overwhelming. Yeah, it's like you go to click on something, and it's like five hours later, you come up for air. You're like, what, <laughs> what just happened? Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Um, but when I was at NEC, they had a really great listening library, um, oh, cool. music library, where they had all these private listening stations with these high-end stereo systems, like component stereo, like, you know, Yamaha, Ankyo, whatever, Kenwood, all, all the right. big brand names. High-end, like, Sony over-the-ear headphones. Yeah. And you could go up to the counter and check out, like, a dozen CDs or, or and sit down and listen to all this music. And they had every concert that had ever been recorded at the school. Oh, so wow. you could go through the database and be like, wait a second, there's a faculty concert that has Dave Holland and yeah. so on and so forth. Let me check that out. Here you go. Sure. And you could listen to, you could spend hours listening to so much great music. And they had these listening rooms, audio visual rooms with TVs and, and VHS players and, um, where we would check out videos. So a group of us would get together after lunch and be like, hey, let's go let's go check out some videos in the library. Yeah. And the group of us, like music geeks, would like sit on the beanbag chairs in the room. And I remember that was my first exposure to Keith Jarrett, okay. a guitar player that's actually from out here, from L.A. He's like, oh, man, you got to check this out. And he puts on uh, one of this, I think it's the Standards Live or one of the, yeah. the trio things that's a video recording, Gary Peacock, Dijonette. And okay, I think I've, I think I've seen it. Yeah, that. and so now I've never heard of Keith Jarrett. This is new to me. Okay. Somehow I hadn't, re- or maybe I've heard him, but I didn't really know. Right. But this was, like, I remember this moment like affected me because here's this guy who sounds like he's like whining and moaning yeah, while yeah, he's yeah. playing the most killing stuff, right? And the, the, Even and his, his playing is yeah. a lot to digest, yeah. let alone just like, the and nature he, of that trio. Uh, yeah, yeah. And each player is like amazing, oh, right? Geez. And we're sitting here and, and the synergy is unreal. Yeah. And then what was happening was like there'd be a moment where like 
we would all freak out about something and then start to talk about it and realize we're all freaking out about something different that happened at the same time. Yeah. Be like, wait, pause that. Wait, what did you hear? Yeah. And we'd rewind it and, be, and I'd listen to what this guy heard. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't even catch that because I was listening to this. Yeah. We'd rewind it and play that. And it would be like this group listening session. Oh, man, that's great. We used to do that all the time. And so I was talking to students about that, like, you should not just be isolated with your earbuds and your YouTube and whatnot. And right. Like, get together. Do some listening with some of your friends. Like, yeah. if you're trying to get to a, another plane of, of level of playing with the, you know, to my bass students, with, like, the drummer in your combo in school, like, go do some listening together. Right. And then try to play like the guys you listen to. One of my best friends to this day is a drummer that I went to school with at NEC, and we used to do that. We used oh, to man. do like bass drum practice sessions. We'd go, yeah, we'd go that. and listen to something, and then we'd be like, "Okay, let's try to play like that." Right. Like, let's try to play like Gary Peacock and Dijonet. <laughs> Not gonna happen, but we're gonna try. Yeah. But but that that effort of like helping each other too. Right. Not feeling like you're in it alone and pointing things out to each other. Where I'd say, "Hey, man, you know, I noticed. I, I feel like I hear he does this thing. Can you try?" I was like, "Oh yeah, let me try that." And so on and so forth, and that kind of stuff back and forth. And so that was a big influence in in how my jazz understanding would grow uh, from like the peer perspective. Sure. But then, so the, the jazz bass teacher at NEC, um, I'm not even sure if he's still there. When I was there, it was Cecil McBee. Okay. And he was a really interesting teacher. Yeah. Sometimes he wanted to talk about technique stuff and I'd say to him, well, that's great. I was like, just so you know, I'm doing half my lessons with some classical guys that are really harping on technique with yeah. me. I was kind of hoping to get more musical perspective. Right. Less Less bass specific and more like genre and experience specific for me. You just want to learn the language. Yeah. yeah. And so we would do that. And, and I felt he always was would always excel in our lessons if I had a really pointed question to ask him. I remember one time, and, and sometimes also what, what we would do, and this was really cool, these same friends that we'd do these listening sessions, yeah. we would every you know few weeks come into each other's lesson so i'd oh, say to, say to cecil like hey was you this know, just under your own like yeah, yeah let's we, do this there yeah. was oh man that's amazing and so so i'd say to like to cecil like hey you know and because we would do every other week because i was splitting my lessons right. jazz and classical i say hey in two weeks when i come back i'd love to bring in a pianist and a drummer and maybe a sax player to play for the lesson so you can hear me in a playing situation yeah and give me some feedback there and he's like i think that's a great idea no, it is, yeah. and so i would do that and there was i remember one time he counted a uh a tune off. It looked like it was like it was. I'm looking at a real book page. He's sure. like, "Let's take a look at this tune." I'm like, "Okay." And I think in the top it said "ballad," and he starts counting off like. And I'm thinking, okay, it seems a little bright. And he's like, "That's your whole note." <laughs> I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> I'm sorry. Come again. What do you think? What I'm like, um. So he was just he was specifically just throwing you something yeah, to see how you were gonna exactly. deal with it. Okay. And which was great. And I remember that particular situation, it was just like, Okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, yeah. three. That that was how that's how well my timekeeping went. Sure. And because I no one had pushed me to play a really fast tempo. Everything we did was like ding, ding, yeah, ding, right. ding. everything was nice and medium and greasy. Yeah. So the second I had to play outside of my comfort zone, I crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. He was like Ah, oh, this is very interesting. As he's stroking his chin and like thinking about <laughs> something very sage to say to me, he's yeah. like, "Your time is not very good." <laughs> like, okay, Man, that's thanks. definitely one of those things that uh, you know that doesn't happen regularly on the gig. No, no, like no. calling tunes that are super up and like I, I, I have to remind myself to yeah. practice that and keep that up. Well, but but to that end, what was really cool is that in that moment, you know, of course he. Took me down a few notches. Like, mm. it's like, you know, I thought your playing was better than this. I'm like, mm, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'll work on that. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know what to do other than I've got to practice at a faster tempo, but how to manage it physically. I just feel like I physically don't know how to do that. And so we talked about that. Like, well, you know, you dig in really hard when it's a medium tempo, but you can't do that when it's right. fast. You got to lighten up. I'm like, yeah. oh. That's kind of obvious now that you say it. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't I realize that? You know, little things. And he would say, when, what, yeah, I remember he talked to me about this breathing breathing exercise that I still use to this day when tempos are bright and I'm feeling like I'm I'm on the edge of starting to slow down. He would say, because you know when something gets tense, you tend to like kind of tighten up mm -hmm. and maybe even hold your breath for a moment. Sure. He was like, you've got to do the opposite. He's like, you've got to intentionally stay he's relaxed. Like, yeah, he's like, don't think about the music. When it gets really fast, I want you to think about your breathing. 
Don't even think about what notes you're playing. I don't uh-huh. care if you play the wrong notes. I want to hear your time get better. So breathe really deep, long breaths and think about breathing into your muscles and think about keeping your arms very relaxed. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, whatever. He's like, let's try it again. You know, here's your, here's your whole note. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we, so we do it again. But I, this time I'm thinking about this stuff and I kid you not, it was like night and day. I still was struggling but it was a, it was like okay now I'm I'm right now I'm in the ballpark now yeah. I'm I'm hanging on, and he's like okay you still have some work to do but now you're getting the hang of it. I was like okay to this day that 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 mental and physical exercise has saved me a few times. I mean that one's huge because it's very relax based. You know yeah. you're just breathing out all the tension in your body, but also the element of just like kind of averting focus. Sure. Like I had a lesson one time and. I was, I remember looking uh, at the fingerboard on the upright, and he's mm. like, "Why are you looking at it? Like, what are you hoping to see?" <laughs> I'm like, "I don't know." It was just <laughs> just yeah, the, like, I'm hoping <laughs> there's the answers. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Right. And he, he held his finger on the wall. He's like, "Just stare, stare right here," yeah. and then like try it again. <clears throat> and you know, out of like the five or six passes I did, three or four of them, it was there. Yeah. Just by kind of letting go and trusting your ears and your hands yeah. to do the job without the mental force. Yeah. Controlling like we, it. we can tend to overthink and yeah. then you start to that snowball effect like, Oh, I did that wrong. And now I'm doing this wrong. And right. Oh my God. You're right. Yeah. Um, so that was one part of, for me, the whole education thing about expanding my jazz knowledge that there was a lot that I didn't know yet. And through experiences like that would help me to like, I, I was re- I was eager to like expose my weaknesses, sure. um, which helped in to some extent. Um, but I, I I think I was also really lucky that I got to have some lessons with some really masterful bases that yeah. would um, impress upon me some musical things that I was too immature to know about. Mm-hmm. I, because I was studying classical and I had been playing you know since I was young, I had a lot of technique sooner than I had. Uh, experience and maturity sure. so I could play notes faster than I knew what to do with them yeah. and so sometimes I would just sound like really immature and I needed somebody to tell me like you know that's not actually really good what you're doing yeah. and uh, there was one experience I had there was a right before I went off to NEC there was a two week jazz workshop in Saratoga New York at a school called Skidmore okay. and they still do it every every summer and when I did it um, the bass teacher one week was a bassist named Todd Kuhlman who I think was James Moody's bassist for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and the other bassist was Milt Hinton, oh, man. the, the, the yeah, judge, the course. legend. And he was really cool. He had this, he had this like raspy voice like Miles Davis, but it was really high pitched. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll never forget my first lesson with him was just, man, to this day, it schooled me. He, he was like, okay, let, let's hear you play some time. And I didn't know what he meant by that. Yeah. You know, I was like, uh, okay. Um, you mean like a walking bass line? Is like, yeah, that, that'll do. I want to hear some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And I'm like, and he's kind of eyeing me like, yeah. you know, what's wrong with this kid? And I'm like, uh, oh, okay. I said, uh, like what? Um, like a blues? He's like, okay, that'd be fine. Let's, let's, hear, let's hear an F blues. I'm like, okay. Gives me a tempo. And at this point in my, uh, my bass immaturity, I had it in, somehow ingrained in my mind that the more rhythmic skips and triplets and cool fills you can do within your walking bass line, the cooler and the hipper you sounded. Right. So I start off like, dick it goon boom boom goon goon dick it goon goon All these syncopations and stuff, and I'm playing yeah. all this stuff. He starts shaking his head back and forth. And, <laughs> I, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he thinks I'm bad. Yeah. Uh, no, no, he thought I was bad. Right, <laughs> right. right. And he, after, after a moment, he's like, no, 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 no. I said, I want you to play me some time. And I'm, now I'm like, mm, I thought I was, right? right. You know, I'm, right. I'm like I'm grooving. I got, I'm grooving. All these I, I got all these. Yeah, I got like, all this stuff worked don't out. Don't you know on. how hip I am? Milk? Exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm going off to NDC in a couple of weeks. I yeah. got it together. <laughs> yeah. Don't you? Don't you know how awesome I think right. I am? Get it together, old man. Yeah, like, right? Check this out. Yeah, exactly. So you know, I try. I try again. I do the same kind of stuff, and he's like, No, 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 no. I said, Can you play me some time? Now, can you play me some time or not? And now I feel like two inches tall, and yeah. I'm thinking apparently not. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay, let me let me try again. Um, do, do you do you just just want like plain quarter notes? You know, plain quarter notes. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's so vanilla. Yeah, you just want quarter <laughs> notes. And, and he says, I want time. And I'm like, oh, jeez, all right. So now this is like the third or fourth time I try. So 
this time I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna play the most solid quarter note I can I can right. manage. And I just boom, 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 just start playing quarter notes. And, he, and as I'm nearing the end of the 12 bars, he starts to smile and bob his head up and down. And he says, all right, all right, there it is. That's why I said time. Why'd you take so long to play me some time? You know? <laughs> like, what, why, why'd you make me wait for it? Right. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. And then the rest of the lesson was like story time with, with the judge. He says, yeah, well, yeah, that yeah. reminds me of this time with Dizzy when we were on the road. And I'm yeah, like, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. You know, it was amazing. But then every day, it was like every day I'd have a lesson with him. And... uh and every day he's like, okay, let's see how your time's doing today. And I, we'd play a different tune and just sure. play through it. We'd play through the tune together. And he'd be like, all right, all right, it's getting better. Keep it up. That reminds me of this other time, you know, yeah. <laughs> another, another half hour of stories, which were priceless. It was amazing. Of course. But that, like, that stuck with me. It was like, oh, my God. Yeah. All right. I, and, and I completely changed my whole way of understanding. And then, then I started transcribing walking bass lines and all these great recordings and realizing, sure. you know, there's maybe like two or three times the bass player does a triplet in like an eight minute track. Yeah. The rest of the time it's all quarter. And I was like, how, where did I get that idea from that you have to do all this cool stuff? Right. That wasn't really cool. Yeah. Some um, of that's depending on the bass player. Sure. There's, there's guys that are more active than others. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but you know, and, but, and there's but skips I, are purposeful to like yeah. create a, a phrase, a two bar phrase mm -hmm. or, but what I also learned from that was that at the time, my time wasn't good enough to do all that stuff and have it work. Right. Like if my time was killing and I did all that stuff, Milt probably would have been like, all right, all right, can you simplify it? Sure. But what he was trying to tell me was like, you're right, not playing time. Thing. You're yeah. not playing good time. Right. All that stuff doesn't work. Right. And, and I realized that afterwards. And to this day with students that are learning from when I'm working with them about how to create walking bass lines, I hear, I hear me and them yeah. every time they try to do a, a syncopation or a triplet and their time goes out the window right away. They, they rush, they, they kind of anticipate the beat and shift the, the beat. And I'm like, right. okay, like, let's do it one more time. And I put on a metronome and now they're having a hard time staying steady. And I said, now do it again and don't do anything but quarter notes. Right. And then it starts to happen. And I say, okay. Yeah, because I mean, you have just the quarter note, like just the time. Yeah. Then you have your note choice within that. If both of those are mm -hmm. are really, really happening, yeah. there's no need for the other stuff. Exactly. The other stuff is specifically for whatever is happening in the moment. Yeah. You know that you're reacting to something yeah. that just happened, but you don't have to instigate yeah. with these and, things. And that stuff. I mean, you can, can come, too. Yeah. It, it's all but that stuff whatever. can come later. You need to get your your foundation solid. Yeah. Or else. All you're doing is shaking that house like an earthquake, right? Right. And and everybody else playing with you will hear that, and they won't want to play with you. Yeah. They'll be like, oh yeah, that that cat. Don't call him. Right. It's it's all that. Yeah. 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 And and so uh, you know, I feel like I was really fortunate in sort of my, you know, extent of my jazz education was getting to have some time spent with some of these old masters that sure. would they weren't concerned with any of the flashy stuff they were concerned with imparting the knowledge of like what your job really is as the a fundamentals, player, the yeah. fundamentals and like get that don't worry about that other stuff right. get this and if you can't get this go do something else with your life yeah yeah you know right um and i i remember also with a lesson one time with cecil where he commented about how and i had never thought of this before he was like when you guys are out there playing you aren't representing me you going out there saying mm. Cecil McBee teaches me to do this, yeah. and you do stuff that I wouldn't teach you to do that I don't approve of you doing that I tell you not to do. You you know you're you're dragging my name through the mud. Wow, I got a reputation. Don't ruin my reputation. Okay, and I was like, oh geez, okay. Yeah, I never really thought about that. I mean, I'm not trying to play badly, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> but I see your point. Like, if you're telling me don't do this, this doesn't work, or fix this, or work on this, and I don't. And I go out there, and then people say, "Oh, who do you study with?" And I say, "Cecil McBee." They say, "Cecil taught you to play like that," and you know what I mean. And so I'm like, "Oh, okay. I uh, sorry, Cecil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on that." Yeah. Um. So, who? What recordings do you send students to to uh, transcribe or like? Mm, yeah. You know, without going all the way back to necessarily Milton Hinton. Sure. Um. Well, yeah, I guess it, it's there's some, <clears throat> you know, like I know John Clayton, we yeah. get requests is like a big record for him. Yeah. Do you have some record? record? Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Record. Um, not necessarily records per se, but it kind of also depends on what the particular thing is that we're working on. Like yeah. for me, when it's a student first diving into walking bass lines, one of my favorite 
um, recordings to, to set them on because I think it's a, a very accessible song harmonically. Because yeah, um, some songs in the jazz repertoire can be very confusing harmonically if yeah. you're new to it. A lot of transitory modulations and whatnot. Sure. Um, but Autumn Leaves is a pretty diatonic tune. Right. And the Cannibal Adderley recording off of something else, yep. uh, Sam Jones. Sam Jones. That bass line is like a perfect textbook. How do you create a walking bass line? Yeah. Do this. Right. And Miles' yeah. solos, how do you create a solo? Like that tune yeah. is just so killing on so many yeah. levels. Exactly. And, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there, yeah, so I've used that, and and I've transcribed it. Yeah. So I have it as like almost like an answer key, like a point of reference. So when I have the students do it, I can quickly look it over and just compare to what I've done. Just be like, okay, yeah, you're you're right, or you're off, or you know, just to kind of guide them in, in in their process of what it's like to kind of take things down by ear and to expand their understanding of notation and whatnot. Sure. But most importantly, for the concept of like, how do I create a walking bass line? Like, I'll talk about the fundamentals of that, but you can do that, but I feel like you need an example. Oh, yeah. Like, and so, like, I'm not going to be in the practice room playing for you every day. Right. So, here's the recording you can listen to every day. And, you know, if you transcribe this, but, you know, you have to also analyze. You have to look at it and say, okay, over a G minor chord, he's playing G, B flat, D. Why is that? Right. Because those are the notes of the G minor chord. Hey, right. there we go. You know, things like that. And so, I think that's a great – and also – Besides harmonic sense, but like what we were talking about before with timekeeping and rhythm and feel, yep. like that's a great example of, of a, just a great walking bass line. And so I've used that a lot in that context. Um, of course, some Ray Brown stuff, like We Get Requests is great. Yeah. Um, Relaxing with the Miles Davis Quintet, PC, that's one of my records. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that record. A lot of times I've had students come to me and be like, yeah, I want to transcribe this thing. And sometimes I'm like, okay, yeah, that's in your wheelhouse. Let's do that. I, I had a student come to me one time with um, uh, Softly in the Morning Sunrise, Paul Chambers, where PC's mm -hmm. playing the melody. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, okay, this is a good one. There's a couple cool things about this for us to work on. So, yeah. And I think you're at a point where you can manage this. Let's do that. Um, and I've had where they come to me. <laughs> I had a student one time uh, come to me, like, you know, early on in his in his uh, progress being like, yeah, I want to I'm trying to transcribe this Christian McBride solo. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, Christian McBride bass transcription is not for the faint of heart. Like you gotta, you gotta be ready. Like right. I've done Unless a few you have of them. A lot of time with transcribing, that's gonna take yeah. you four years. And it, exactly, and I and I've done a few where I'm like, okay, this is all right. This is this is hard, mm -hmm. uh, and and I feel like I know what I'm doing with that. Right. Um, where I had to kind of gently kind of steer this guy. Like, okay, I see what this tune is. Listen to it. I'm like, okay, I see what you're looking for. Let me take you to something else first. Yeah. That's gonna kind of be a stepping stone to get you there sure. because I feel and I, and I try to be careful not to discourage I try to teach with, right. with encouragement not discouragement so I try to say listen this is really challenging I find this challenging and I'm concerned that you're going to kind of get caught in a black hole where you're going to spend a lot of time on this and feel frustrated uh, right, by all means just not, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say you're not ready for this but here's something else that's similar yeah. who came before like here's a Ray Brown thing or here's here's um um, you know, a Paul Chambers thing or an Oscar Pettiford thing. Here's something else that's gonna. This falls in the lineage of that. Sure. This is gonna be a little more accessible. Yeah. More manageable, and a lot more uh, a faster attain more attainable goal for you. Yeah. So let's set smaller, more achievable goals so you can do that, and that'll get you. And by the time you get through a bunch of this, this thing that you're struggling to do now is gonna seem much more manageable. Let's yeah. get you. Let's get you there. Right. Because I mean. I don't, do you know Christian? I don't know Christian. I've met him a couple times. I don't. Okay. I don't know him. Know him. Right. But My only point is like Christian didn't start right at Christian. No. Christian went through Ray. So if you want to, if you want to get to where Christian is, like, pick up some of the, go on the path that yeah. Christian was on. Yeah. You know, like if yeah. you want that thing, get it where he got it. Oh, exactly. So just like go yeah. to Ray, and go to PC, go to Sam Jones, go. Sure. And I'm sure he would say the same thing. Um, I will say though that Christian is such a, f a phenomenal bass player that he was he was Christian before most people could get to being like Christian. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean, like like he w he was amazing when he was in high school. Yeah, you know. So it's like okay. I mean, to try and be like him is is a very lofty goal. Sure, doesn't mean you shouldn't strive towards that. But uh, yeah. But but my point being that like you know as far as like recordings that I go to, um, I don't. That's that's for a more advanced player to start digging into some of his stuff. Although there are some of his things that are not quite as advanced, that are are more um, 
attainable. There was one I worked with a student where it was a blues, and it was actually a really great bass solo that was very thematic, and for the most part, not super chopsy because he has tremendous technique that some of his solos can be such a flurry of notes that it's like, yeah, I, even if I get them all down, I don't know if I can even play them. Right. I, I forget what tune it was. It was a blues, but it was a particular tune where the majority of his solo was very bluesy, very thematic. Just laying into it. Just laying into it where I was like, okay, this is actually a good one. It's a great uh, lesson in how to develop motifs in your solo. Yeah. And, it's, and a lot of it was actually down in the bass range. Oh, cool. So it was like for a student who's just kind of st- – starting to get his his feet under him this is actually tough for him but a good achievable goal it's gonna it's gonna work for it but i think he can do it yeah yeah, yeah. um so yeah i mean that's what I, I that's what i try to do with him as far as that stuff and you know i i do have some recordings i i turn to there's a great red mitchell bass solo on um ornithology where it's just one chorus mm. So it's just one chorus down, and, and it's also very thematic. It's a lot of great bebop vocabulary in his solo. Yeah. So that it covers a lot of ground in a short right. one pass through the tune. So it, do, it doesn't necessarily take you a long time to get it, and I've had success with students on that transcription where when they're able to play along with the recording, they feel like they're playing bebop. I mean, because right. they are. Sure. Um, where, like, before they started that, they didn't know how to play exactly you had to do that and then, right. and then they start hearing like okay and, and and i also with with certain and trans- getting it through how a bass player has digested it mm-hmm. and not like trying to cop the omni book right is you know like exactly exactly you don't need to go to the omni book and, like, and that's go through how it was exactly adapted to the bass and how right. it's going to lay a lot easier and that's part that was the nice thing i was going to say about it is not not only just what are the notes but how to phrase like that bass yeah. player because uh, I remember I did a, an Oscar Pettiford transcription when I was at USC, and I, I had a really cool response from Peter Erskine. He was like, "He said all he wrote was good Pettiford eighth notes," <laughs> and 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 what he meant was like, "You you did a good job of matching the way he's feeling and, and phrasing the eighth notes." It's it's not outdated, but it's dated. Like that's sure. not necessarily how you would swing eighth notes today, right? And that's probably not how you swing eighth notes when you're playing on your own, mm-hmm. but you you understood to do this transcription properly yeah. that was part of it not just get the notes but how to play like he right. played feel what they feel feel what yeah. they feel because you're not necessarily going to play like that but that's going to be a component that adds to it's your it's in there and you have it to pull from exactly and it'll help you shape your phrase exactly. so you can you know couple that with the Dave Holland thing or mm-hmm. whatever else is going on mm-hmm. I think that's so huge to uh, yeah. keep your bandwidth really really wide so you have all these things yeah and you know hopefully it, you can I mean, the next step is getting in touch with yourself and really being able to imagine and sure. pull that and hear it in your inner ear and feel it and all the honesty yeah. of presence and all that. But it's in there. So you're not yeah. just yeah, this the, one thing that comes out and it's just that every time. Yeah, exactly. To get, get to get from that academic experience of, right. of taking this down, practicing it, learning to play like them. And then how does that organic transformation take place so that this can become part of how you play? Because it won't necessarily happen immediately. No. I, I remember also when I was in Boston, there's a great bass player in Boston named John Lockwood. And I did okay. um, one year, one of my, I think it was my junior year, I did my jazz lessons with him. So I did two years with Cecil. My third year, I did my jazz lessons with John Lockwood. And I wasn't ready for John Lockwood. Okay. Um, because... He's a really organic player. Conceptual like, guy? Conceptual guy. I mean, he can do all the fundamentals. He knows all that. He's not really, he doesn't want to talk about that. Not that he doesn't want to, but I would say to him, like, you know, so how do I play a bebop line? Yeah, how, do I, how do I to solo? His music comes from this other place. Well, his answer to that was go transcribe. Huh. I'm like, yeah, but I'm paying for these lessons with you. Can you just tell me how to do it? <laughs> and he's like, this is how you do it. Go transcribe some Charlie Parker solos. Yeah. And I'm like, but can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 right. and, and so I wasn't ready for his level of teaching because I still m- was pretty immature musically. Sure. I didn't understand a lot of that because I also was doing a lot of classical studying where a lot of my classical studying was a teacher saying, here's how you do this bow technique. Right. Here's how you play this thing. Let me show you. Now you practice it. So I would go to that jazz lesson and be like, show me how to do that and be like, well, go listen to the recording. How did, how did those jazz approaches affect your classical playing? Like this it opened my ears. Open mind. It opened my ears a lot. Yeah, it, where, where it affected my classical playing the most was in the orchestra. Okay. When I would notice that, you know, you got like eight bass players in a line that need to sound like one bass player. Yeah. And what I found was this: uh, there is a certain level of humility you need to in, uh, embody in order to blend. So sometimes 
you might be right with what you're about to do, but because the majority rule is going to do this thing, if you want to sound like a good bass section, you got to join in. Right. And maybe we have to play this note a little early, even though it feels wrong to me from my, my jazz knowledge of playing good time, sure. of Milt hitting in my head being like, right. play me time. <laughs> yeah, right. In the classical setting, the time is a little different. Sometimes it has a, a lot more elasticity. And so sometimes the bass section has to sound a little early or play a little early to sound on time which was a lesson I learned also one time when I was principal of a bass section uh, at Tanglewood, okay. that, that summer program where the basses kept sounding late in this one entrance and the conductor kept giving us a hard time. And I was finally, I said to him, I said, excuse me, maestro, I'm help me out here. Like I'm, I'm watching you like a hawk. I'm not even looking at the music. Right. I'm when your baton goes down, I play. He's like, well, that's why you're late. Yeah. And I was like, uh, said the no getting to him by yeah. the time the baton. I was like, <laughs> yeah. what, 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 what do you mean? Yeah. And he had to explain physics and sound waves. He's like, you're at the back of the orchestra, yet your bass frequencies move slower. Mm -hmm. So if you wait to articulate that note for when you see my baton hit the downbeat, by the time I hear it, it's late. So you need to find that fraction of a moment before I strike the downbeat to attack and articulate so that it projects and arrives on time. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Sure. So that we didn't. Then we said, okay. Let's take it again. And so I just, you know, I said everybody, just go with me, right? Because I'm the section leader. Right. Watch me and just time it with me. And so I did that. I watched his baton come down, and I played right before he hit the downbeat. And then he looked up and he and he stopped the orchestra. He goes, "Bases, you're on time <laughs> finally." And I was like, "Oh my god!" And so I started. To, so that my jazz knowledge at first kind of messed me up in the sense of timekeeping and wanting to be like really good about time and sure. realizing in the classical setting in an orchestra it doesn't work quite the same way i need to be more elastic and more malleable to the moment mm -hmm. in order to sound on time and it felt really weird yeah but i made peace with that and then i found but then even bringing that back into your playing your jazz playing as you mature as a jazz player and then you realize that well you can't be elastic but the the in, internal pulse sure. is still like Sure. It's got the mill hitting yeah, thing, there's a, but you can... Yeah, there's a back and forth. Yeah. They can hand off to each other in ways that it's hard to explain necessarily, but once you're in the middle of it, it starts to make sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I, I, would, I would also notice, like, a lot of classical players, when they're reading their part and you're playing through a Dvorak symphony or something, you look at your note and you, the, a lot of the players might not, the violas viola player might not realize the viola section might not realize that the note that they're playing is like an internal harmony supporting the melody that the violin is playing mm -hmm. and so kind of understanding your place in the harmonic structure sure. so even though we might all have like mezzo forte marked my mezzo forte has to be a little different than their mezzo forte because i shouldn't be louder than the melody i should right. be supporting and things like that so i found um my jazz playing helped inform my musical understanding in the symphony setting where I found listening to uh, harmonic information and dynamic information and timing information was a different thing. And so I would kind of let these two worlds start to kind of blend in my brain. So I felt like I could do the best job in that moment. Right. Um, yeah, I feel like it's sort of a vague answer, but no, it's, um, it's kinda... I mean, I feel like any, any other thing you do, you know, whether it's like really getting into another genre on either the electric or upright, like you, you're on the same axe, but you get into another genre. So mm -hmm. like that's going to inform the other one. Absolutely. And then the electric thing informs the upright and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, when I started writing that, that completely ha affected how I played. Yeah. Uh, so writing, you know, the, the couple of times I dipped my toe in the production yeah. world that, that changed it all. Yeah. And it's just, you, you learn these different skills. And I guess it's back to the bandwidth thing. You just yeah. and your ears are now, you're outside of your head, and you're thinking about the the whole of it all. Yeah, and but that's also um, obviously that you're saying that's an experience thing, right. and I think it's also a maturity thing because uh, some things I've talked about with some students that are you know starting out, and I'll talk about being aware of these other things happening on stage while they're playing their thing, and it to them I can see they just feel overloaded. Yeah, they're like how can I possibly Pay attention to what the drummer's doing with his ride cymbal and his kick drum and his hi hat, while I'm trying to play my time. Think about how to improvise a walking bass line. And right, I'm thinking about the notes and the chord. And yeah, yeah, I like. I'm trying to figure out what do I do when I see a, a minor major seven chord, and yeah. you're telling me I got to pay attention to the drummer and that I should be listening to what the soloist is doing. Like, how can I do? And I remember 
when I was younger feeling the same way. Like, how can I possibly listen to that? Yeah. I, I have to only listen to me right now or else I'm just going to fall apart. And so there's an experience thing there. What, is, what is your response to this question? How do you, uh, what have you learned? How do you, let me try to, let me rephrase that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you, um, how do you think about how you listen? Mm. Like, it, 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 do you consciously have a perspective on it? Like, if I, if I just remove myself from being behind the bass, right. then I can hear it all in real time. You know, yeah. I don't hear every little nuance unless I want to sure. check in with the drummer to see, like, where he's putting his eighth note yeah. on the ride. Yeah, or, yeah, like, yeah. if it's a pop thing, listen to yeah. how far back the kick is. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's those elements, absolutely. Because yeah. um, as a bass player, one of the first things I try to do right away is make sure I lock with whatever the drummer is doing. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I've I've made good friends with a lot of drummers because of that. Yeah. Because they, they know right o- after playing with me for a couple minutes that I'm going to listen to them. Sure. Um, and, and they know that I'm... I, I think it's funny, once they realize that that's what you're doing, like and just in a playing, mm-hmm. when, they, when, when they shift it, mm-hmm. just to double check... Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it's like okay, and then they put it back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, dude, yeah, I heard it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going the, with you through the, both yeah, of those. They're like, okay, we'll be friends. Yeah, we're, <laughs> it's now like, we're cool. okay. Um, but I mean, I'm not sure I know a really good answer to that, other than what I do at this point for me is that I am always trying to listen to everything else that's happening. Yeah. I really, I really do try to split my listening into many fractured parts at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some of it depends on the difficulty level of what I'm having to play. Sure. So, for instance, if I'm somebody calls a tune, I know a straight ahead tune, and I'm just playing a walking bass line. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, I got Milt in my ear telling me play yeah. play time. I'm gonna play straight quarter notes. I'm not gonna get too fancy. Uh, I'm gonna try to stay in a particular range that clears up the 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 sound spectrum for all the other instruments. Like, you know, if there's a guitar and a piano, I'm going to try to walk in my lowest range so that they have room to find their, Mm -hmm. their space. Um, and in that situation, I don't have to think quite as much, quite as intensively, I should say about what I'm doing so I can listen to what they're doing a little more and I can catch more of what they're throwing around the bandstand. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas if I am like, reading a tune that's got some really intricate rhythms and I'm in that place. Uh, I'm trying to keep my ears open at all times because I clearly have to make sure I'm locking up and, and, and I'm yeah. not messing up, but I, I am a little more focused on my thing in that moment because now there's something more challenging in front of me. Right. And, and you're then, responsible for this and your ear might think, yeah, maybe there's a, something that's written specifically, mm-hmm. you know, in, I wouldn't say conflict, but you know, it's like it's perfectly there's a rub somewhere on sure, purpose. Sure, exactly. Because that's yeah. what they want. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got to stick to the ink and kind of plow right ahead. Yeah, and so it, you know, th- those are challenging moments. But you know, I, I think kind of how that question addresses to like what I say to students. You say like, you know, how can I listen to all this? I'm trying to figure my thing out. Yeah. It's like, well, it's just it might be hard right now. But you have to keep that as a goal and keep working towards it, and it will get easier. If you don't ever think about doing it, you're not going to get better at it. Right. So I, I try to make it be something they're aware of, and I'll say, like, this might feel too difficult at the moment or very challenging at the moment, but you need to be aware of it because eventually it won't be, and it will overall it will improve your playing, yeah. and it will help you. So you need to be aware of it. You need to work towards that. Uh, and as you get better at your thing, you will be able to free up some more, some more headroom right. able to, to add those other elements in, you know, in other words, you will never be able to stop listening and paying attention while you're playing. Right. Um, but you'll be able to kind of shift your focus around a little bit. Right. Um, I completely agree with you. You know, and so I just say, you know, it might be really hard right now, but you just got to keep working towards it. Yeah. Keep putting yourself in situations. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's part of it. I mean, definitely. practice that. Sure. By doing it. Gary, thanks for doing this, man. Yeah. All right. (laughs) All right. That was Mr. Gary Wicks. I loved his ideas about listening to music with peers um, and bringing his his peers in school into the lesson with him uh, so that his teacher could get a real kind of a real gauge on what was happening and how he communicated with others and all the other things that go into playing jazz instead of just going through a piece of music. Um, that's a really great idea. Um, as far as listening to music with peers, I still try to do that as much as possible and get someone else's perspective. I think that's really important. 
as well. Um, so thank you, Gary, for coming in and sharing that. After the interview, we uh, we hung out and we played duo for a little bit. It was a lot of fun. I um, I kind of hacked my way through uh, a classical thing he put in front of me, and uh, then we just we just played some tunes. It was a lot of fun. Um, what else is going on for all the listeners out there? Interested in signing up for the Bay Shed newsletter? You can now text the word "shed" s h e d to six six eight six six to easily sign up for the newsletter and receive free transcriptions and uh, the happenings related to the Bay Shed. Once again, that is s h e d to the number six six eight six six. Please take a second to do that and stay connected. And uh, that's all I got for today, folks. I think I'm going to go take a nap. Uh, Be good, and I'll see you soon.